I'm speaking with Professor Lisa Shapiro, author of No Forgotten Fronts, From Classrooms to Combat. Thank you for speaking with me. Thank you for having me. It's nice to be here. So when did you start writing history? I actually began researching history a number of years ago. One of my first books was historical uh, fiction, and I wrote that with a co-writer. Her name is Deborah Reed, and we went to England. We wrote um, a book called uh, The Chamber and the Cross, set in England in two time periods, modern and medieval England. And we did quite a bit of research for that book. We uh, walked historic battlegrounds, we visited castle ruins, and we even studied the procedures for exhuming human remains. It was a remarkable research and writing experience, and my love of history really grew out of that first um, historical fiction hmm. book that I did. So, have you always wanted to write a book about um, the particular subject of our uh, the book we're talking about? My interest in World War II um, came out of my work in the classroom, and I began teaching in 2003, so not that long after 9-11. Mm -hmm. And I'm in, a, I'm in a community college classroom in San Diego, and San Diego, as you well know, has many military bases. Mm -hmm. And so I have always had lots of veterans in my, in my classes. And it was really apparent to me from the very beginning. At the time, I was teaching English and, and creative writing. And I felt that somehow the fabric of society was changing. Veterans coming back for more. I mean, it's, it's obviously not the first time in history that's happened. This seems to happen over and over again. Mm -hmm. But I really wanted to better understand what these veterans were bringing back to the classroom and I was also very aware in my classes that the classroom is often one of the first points of contact that veterans have as they're transitioning back to our society. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to see if I could facilitate that process. And that's when I really began researching war literature in general. I decided to go back to school and get a second master's degree in literature with an emphasis on war literature. Hmm. And it was really just this, this interest I had in better understanding my student veterans. And that's when I discovered, I live in San Diego, and at San Diego State University, in the archives, there's a collection of letters written by students who served in World War II. And that began this passion that I had for researching that particular era. So, um, your focus in war literature, did you focus mainly on veterans' memoirs or also um, memoirs by, you know, people who are participants, civilians and such? You know, when I began reading war literature, I started with some of the classics and then I progressed to memoir. And some of my favorite writers um, actually came out of the Vietnam era. So, Philip Caputo, A Rumor of War. Um, I've read Carl Marlantis. In fact, his book, um, What It Is Like to Go to War, is on my shelf. And I also read um, Dear America, which is a collection of letters from Vietnam. So, so a lot of what I was trying to understand came out of the Vietnam era. But then I extrapolated as much as I could. And as I started reading letters from the World War II era, I began doing research specifically in World War II. I had a lot of catching up to do. It's, it's not my area, or it didn't used to be my area mm. of expertise. Um, and so I had a lot of catching up to do. I read a lot about World War II. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about the subject matter and focus of, of uh, No Forgotten Fronts. No Forgotten Fronts, From Classrooms to Combat, is based on this archive of letters. There are thousands of letters. It's, it's estimated, I think the archivists have estimated that there are close to 5,000 letters in the collection. And it's an unusual collection because a lot of times when you're looking at letters, you might be looking at a celebrity or a, an important historical figure who writes letters out to their contacts. So you often have one person writing to several or many individuals. This letter collection is really unique, not, not just the sheer volume of it, but it was students writing to one professor. So what happened 
And and if you if you think about it, at the time the campus was very small. There were probably two thousand students at what was then San Diego State College. And Pearl Harbor happened, mm-hmm. and this professor, you know, students immediately started leaving campus and going into military service, both men and women. And this professor, his name was Dr. Post, Lauren Post. He taught geography. He himself was a veteran of World War One. And I I think he had a a sense, an intuitive sense of what his students might be in for. And he started collecting addresses and he started this letter writing campaign. And what he did is he asked students to write to him and they did. And letters as they went to training camps and then eventually to combat theaters, they sent letters back to this one professor at campus. And again, that's what makes the collection unusual is that you have so many people writing to one individual. And he took excerpts from their letters, and he prepared a newsletter. This was this was his intention all along, and the archivists jokingly call it the the Facebook of World War II because he took excerpts from all of these letters, made this newsletter, and then he mailed the newsletter out to everyone on his list. The students read it, they passed it around, they wrote even more letters, and it really mushroomed. And, and so more and more letters came in, the newsletter got bigger. And what's remarkable to me is not only that he did this on their behalf, but he did it every single month for four full years throughout the war. Mm-hmm. And, and students really talked about how important it was to them. And, and in fact, if, if you don't mind, um, I, I picked a few select letters sure. just to give you, just to give you and your, your audience a sense of, how important this campaign was. So let me read you, if you don't mind, an excerpt. Um, This was written by a lieutenant junior grade, Bob Noel. And the students, by the way, called him Doc. So he was Doc Post. Okay. And their their mascot was Montezuma. That's the campus mascot, ruler of the Aztec Empire. And they called themselves the Fighting Aztecs. And this will just give you a flavor of, of how important this was. So, so, so Bob Noel writes, Sometimes, Doc, the going gets pretty tough, even on a battle wagon. And you feel discouraged and disgusted. And somehow the word newsletter flashes in your brain, and you pick out an old issue at random and start thinking of the other fellow, fellow Aztec. You think of the guy who used to drop by for you every morning and drive you out to state. It wasn't much of a car, and we invariably had engine trouble, and I don't recall ever making an 8 o'clock class on time. But you can't help thinking of what a swell guy he was and how badly you felt when you learned that, that he had been killed in a bombing raid over Germany. You read about others who have been killed or wounded, and you read about others who have been away from the state a hell of a lot longer than you have. And so then you realize that things aren't tough at all. You've just been kidding yourself. And so to me, that excerpt really shows how important this newsletter was to these young men and women mm-hmm. and how it kept them connected not only to one another, but back to their back to their campus. And that's what Dr. Post did throughout World War II. So how, how many students um, participated in writing? Writing to I would I would estimate that there were several hundred, you know, there were probably 2,000 students on campus, and I would say hundreds of them and their families wrote to Dr. Post. Mm-hmm. Um, lots of lots of women as well as men, and, and lots of people wrote repeatedly. Um, mm-hmm. So so he received, as I mentioned, you know, thousands of letters. Um, and the collection just just really grew over time and it caught the attention of people around the city so it was very important to families and 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 they passed it around local businesses began supporting him it cost a lot of money to produce it It, it, you have to remember this is back in the days before there was anything digital so he had typing classes helping him type up excerpts and he edited every every single letter by hand mm-hmm. in fact one of the fun things about going into the archives is that you can you can handle the original letters the original documents the university has has kept the collection which dr post donated um after he retired 
So you can handle the letters and, and you can see his penciled notes about the excerpts. But then he got typing classes to prepare them. He got fraternities to um, also help with the production. He got local businesses to help. Mothers sent dollars with their letters to help pay for postage. Mm-hmm. And, and, and on it went throughout, throughout the war. So I noticed when I went to your website, um, you mentioned that sometimes he had information um, through the letters. He had information before it came out in the official newswire. So I'm curious, how much did the uh, U.S. military establishment either help or maybe hinder or censor uh, his work, if, if at all? It worked both ways, and Dr. Post was very careful about censorship. In fact, one of the very first things that happened after he produced, I want to say, no more than about two issues, um, the censors quickly got their hands on an issue, and they sent him a very long list of things that he needed to pay attention to. And they were, they were very clear that um, he was not to disclose the location of troops. He was not to give out complete addresses. Um, they sent him a copy of a press release um, that, that was, I think, part of the guidelines for anyone in journalism about they didn't want, um, if a mailbag, for example, were captured, they didn't want the enemy to be able to piece together the location of, of troops around the world. And Dr. Post took that very seriously. He took that to heart. And so by the time he produced, I want to say, his third newsletter, and he let people know that he was going to restrict um, the amount of, of information he published about where they were. And I believe the rule was that he could not release specifics about campaigns, and the students knew this too in their letters to him, until it had been cleared for um, publication by the press. And so Dr. Post was very careful. Um, And so one example, just um, in in a letter to him, a pilot noted the type of plane he was flying, a B-25 bomber. And Dr. Post would cross out the mention of the specific type of plane, and he would just write the generic plane. Mm -hmm. So he did that. He did that a lot. Um, He was also very conscious of the fact that... um, Sometimes the students would reveal specifics about their injuries or the the trauma they had suffered during a battle. And either the student would say to him, I don't want the folks at home to necessarily know all of these details. Or Dr. Post would um, maybe give a few less facts about a specific injury if he felt that mothers and daughters were, or mothers and, and, and wives were also reading the newsletter. He didn't want that graphic information to maybe upset families. So there was a lot of care taken at a lot of levels. But Dr. Post got in the habit of sending the newsletter to the Office of Censorship in Washington. Mm -hmm. So he got their guidelines. He obliged them. He sent the newsletter to the Office of Censorship. And they communicated back to him and they said, thank you, we're very impressed. You've, You've met our criteria. And and they approved of, of his um, the way that he was publishing the information. Now, not all students were as, as careful as they, they could have been. Mm-hmm. Most of them would not reveal where they were. So you often see letters that say um, somewhere in the Pacific or somewhere in Germany. And that was pretty standard. In fact, the students joked about it. Mm-hmm. One One writer said, I've gotten used to putting somewhere in the Pacific on my letters for so long that when I come back to San Diego, I'm just going to list somewhere in San Diego as my permanent address. I mean, they they got used to that. But every now and then they thought something was cleared. They thought they were okay to reveal the details. And the censors read their letters, and you can see either words that were blacked out or in one case, um, or in several cases, they would take a, an exacto knife and they would literally cut out a rectangle. A word or a phrase would be cut out of the letter. Unfortunately for someone like me, that, that ruins the writing on the... If the student were writing on both sides of the page, you then can't see hmm. the words on the other side of the paper as well. So there are lots of instances where the censors um, took steps. Dr. Post certainly took steps. And the students were as careful as they, as they could be. About, about censorship. And then again, recognizing that they understood that what they were writing 
was meant to be included in the newsletter. Every now and then a student would say to Dr. Post, this is just for you. I only want you to know this because they were trying to get something off their chest that they felt would be upsetting to um, the folks at home. Now, you also asked about, about, you know, Dr. Post having all of this information. Right. One thing that was really remarkable to me, and this happened repeatedly, is Dr. Post was able to understand sometimes before the families got official notification, little bits and pieces of information about where people were located or what they were doing. And he kept in touch with the families and he got information to where it was needed. And I'll, I'll give you sort of two examples of, of that. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the writers who wrote to Dr. Post a lot, his name was Wally McAnulty. And he was in the South Pacific. He was with an anti-aircraft regiment. And his brother, Ernie, was flying planes. Ernie was shot down and became a prisoner in Stalag Lustree. In you know, the German prisoner of war camp, mm-hmm. and Wallace or Wally was writing to Doctor Post, but Ernie also wrote to Doctor Post, and so I think there was some um, constraint. Wally, as a, as, a, as a service member, was not. I, I don't believe he was allowed to write directly to his brother once his brother was in that prisoner of war camp. Mm-hmm. So, so Doctor Post would get information from Ernie and pass it along, and, 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 and it went both ways. So Dr. Post was, was literally writing to both brothers, and they were both writing to him, but what was really touching to me is that both of the boys, both Ernie and Wally, these two brothers, both of them thanked Dr. Post for visiting their mother. Hmm. And she, she also had written to Dr. Post. And so if you can picture this professor He's writing to one young man who's stationed in the Pacific. He's giving him information. He's also writing to the mother. Now he's receiving information from this prisoner of war camp. And then he's going to visit the mother to reassure her that both of her sons are okay. And, and that, was, that was the role that Dr. Post played. Um, one other example of that, uh, there was a young man, his name was... Um, uh, Jim or James Hurley, and he was at the uh, at the invasion of um, Anzio. So, so the the invasion of the Italian coast. Right. And he was pinned. He was pinned down uh, under days of artillery fire. It, it was a brutal invasion. And as you know, the the, the forces, uh, Allied forces, were trapped for a while on, on that beach. Mm-hmm. And and. Jim was a very honest writer, and that was another thing that really stunned me, I think, in, in reading these letters, is how honest uh, some of these writers were. And, and Jim wrote that he'd been trapped on the beach at Anzio, and in, in typical sort of honest and yet humorful fashion, his way of describing what happened to him was to say that he lost his marbles. He wrote, my marbles, my marbles were scattered all over the place. It took me three days to collect them. <laughs> Well, Dr. Post had been through World War I, and so he understood shell shock. Right. And he was able to read between the lines, and okay, so Jim has some pretty bad shell shock. Mm-hmm. And, and this is to me what, what, what Dr. Post did that again was so remarkable. He knew that there was another person from state, another Aztec, who happened to be an army chaplain, also stationed in Italy. And Dr. Post wrote immediately to the army chaplain and said, go and visit Jim. He needs you. And the chaplain wrote back and said, I'm on it. I'm on my way. I'll get there as soon as I can. And then Dr. Post wrote to the father, to Jim's father, to say, I've sent this chaplain. He's going to go visit your son. And the father wrote back to Dr. Post to say, thank you. He was really, really glad that there was someone who was going to be able to give his son spiritual Consolation that, that that meant so much to the father, mm-hmm. and and so Doctor Post sort of set these pieces in motion, and then Jim continued to write to Doctor Post 
And after Italy, you know, the the Allies were turning their attention then to the invasion of Normandy. They were pushing into Germany. And Jim was still in Italy. And, and he felt that what he had done, and he'd lost a very good friend in the fighting. And, and Jim felt that what he and his friend had fought for was somehow being overshadowed by events in Normandy and in Germany. He felt that what they had done might be forgotten. And Dr. Post was very clear. Dr. Post wrote to him and said, Jim, there are no forgotten fronts, not as long as we have Aztecs on them. And he said, we have Aztecs on all the fronts. And so Dr. Post promised, it was a promise he made to Jim, and it was really a promise he made to all of his students that no one would be forgotten. And I, 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 I was so moved by that, and, and that became the, the title of the book. Mm-hmm. But it was really Dr. Post's written promise to his students. And, and, and I think that's what he intended all along with his newsletter, that they would always know, no matter where they were in the world, that they had people at home thinking about them, that they were connected to their campus. So how did he get information if any of the people he, he was corresponding with, any of the students, if they were killed in fighting or, or badly injured, did he... How did he find that out, and how did he deal with that? You know, it, it, it's it's a great question, and it, it surprised me when I when I looked at the newsletter. So he has all the all the letters, and I was able to read all of the letters that are in the collection. Um, but then I was also able to read the actual newsletters. And one of the things that surprised me is that in every issue of, of every newsletter, really on the front page, he wrote a little column. He, he, and that was where you really hear Dr. Post's correspondence back to the students, this little column that he wrote to, the, to say, you know, here's what's going on on campus. Here's what's going on right now in the war. You know, he would always say, best of luck. We're thinking about you. Um, but then also on the front page of every newsletter, was a list of who was had been reported killed in action, who had been reported missing. Um, he also gave promotions, mm-hmm. but right on the front page, right on the front page, you would see um, the list of um, people who'd been killed in action, taken prisoner, or, or had been reported missing. And then he asked people to write to him and let him know more. And so I mentioned um, Jim Hurley was the young man who was trapped on the beach at Anzio, and he'd lost a friend. His friend was Russell Newbury. And Dr. Post had heard that Russell was killed. He wrote to the family, but he also wrote to um, military sources. So he would write to, in some cases, the adjutant general, or he would write to chaplains that he knew. And then his letters would get passed along up the chain of command. Um, And in one case, the acting adjutant general wrote back to Dr. Post to say, "Um, I heard that you were inquiring about this student. And yes, I can confirm for you that he was killed in Italy. And so and, and Dr. Post also had been in contact with the boy's father who wrote to him and said, Yes, we lost our son, Russell. He was killed in, in action in Italy. So Dr. Post um, would send out queries, and then he would hear back, sometimes informally from students, and then he would do his best to confirm that with the family. The family would get notified. And sometimes through his queries, he would hear directly from official sources. Um, there were several instances where he had information that wasn't accurate. Um, in one newsletter... He published an account that a that a um, uh, a pilot had been reported missing and perhaps killed, and it turned out later that the pilot was a prisoner of war, and so he would update that news as it came in. And you know, again, what what I think is is hard for people nowadays to realize is how long it took for the mail mm-hmm. to come in, and 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 how long. They had to wait sometimes to get news. In fact, Dr. Post was funny. He had kind of a funny and dry sense of humor. And in one of his articles or in one of his little columns in the newsletter, he wrote, we want to hear from you. And then you can almost hear him pause in his writing. And he says, really? 
if you've been in a battle, if there's been a campaign and you've been fighting, we need to hear from you after it's over. And then he wrote, figure it out. Like, come on, guys, we want to know that you're okay. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the students did. They wrote, they wrote to him. They also wrote eulogies, I think, without even necessarily meaning to or without even necessarily thinking that that's what they were doing. But when they realized that they had lost friends and sometimes they learned from the newsletter that they had lost friends. Mm-hmm. You know, they might be stationed in a different part of the world in a, in a different campaign theater and they would learn that one of their friends had been killed. Mm-hmm. And then these letters would come in and they would say, I remember we grew up together. You know, you have to remember that, you know, San Diego at the time was, was a much smaller town. The campus was not that big. These guys sometimes went to elementary school together where they were in middle school together and then they went to college together. They were in fraternities together. They were on the football team together. These guys were buddies. Mm-hmm. And they would write letters and they would say, I can remember playing a football game with him. I can't believe he's gone. I can't yeah. believe that, that, that I lost my friend. And, and they would write these, these incredibly touching letters. And Dr. Post would, would print those as well. So did uh, Dr. Post have, um, did he have his own children and did he have any relatives in the war? He did not have his own children. Um, his wife, uh, her name was Valeria, and her, her maiden name was Postnikov. There's kind of a funny story about how they met. Um, they were seated next to each other in a class. I believe they both went to Berkeley together and got advanced degrees. Um, so he was Post, and she was Postnikov or Postnikova. And that's how they met, was just that they were seated next to each other in class. Um, they married, they never had children, but Dr. Post and his wife were both very active in the lives of their students. So Dr. Post, in addition to being a teacher, he took his students on field trips. Um, in, in fact, he, um, he was also involved in um, researching um, the Cajuns of Louisiana, that was his area of expertise. And he was also very involved in um, Western um, history. And he was known for practicing trick roping. He, he often gave these roping demonstrations on, on campus. And his students loved to watch him practice roping. He, he sometimes tried to teach them how to do roping. Uh, he took them on field trips um, to study um, uh, geography. So, so his students were, were, were really devoted to him. And his wife was a singer, and his students also attended her recitals. She taught, uh, I, I believe she was involved in San Diego's Light Opera Company, and she taught singers in their home. So even though they didn't have their own children, they were both very active um, in the lives of, of, of students, and but, but by teaching and by participating in these various activities. Dr. Post's nephew, uh, his name was Bill, um, was in the Marines. And even though Bill's letters are not part of the archival collection at San Diego State, there's mention in the newsletter. So Dr. Post would get separate letters from his nephew, and occasionally he would write a column about where his nephew was and what his nephew was doing. So he did have a nephew who was active in, in, in combat. Do you know of any other people doing this sort of thing around the country? Anyone else? In, in terms of working with this letter collection? Uh, no, um, in terms of doing what Dr. Post did, getting letters from maybe maybe not students but a group of people that had gone you know out into the war you know anything like um, this you know the the only thing i know of really is um the book the collection by bernard edelman dear america letters home from vietnam um, he collected letters from, from servicemen who'd, who'd been in Vietnam, although I believe they were writing to various families, not just to one professor. Um, Andrew Carroll, The Legacy Project, um, he's been very active for, I think, a couple of decades now, collecting letters. Again, um, families sometimes will donate letters, so things that have been written to 
individual families, and then they will, sometimes the families will donate the letters either to a collection like Dear America or to um, the Legacy Project. And Andrew Carroll's written several, I believe, compilations of books with, so you can read, you know, letters, I think going all the way back to the Civil War, you can read letters from various individuals who've been in combat. The thing that I believe is unusual about the San Diego State Collection is I don't know of any other collections where there are so many letters just written to one person, where there's really just this focus on one community or one group of students. Mm -hmm. And it's really a through line, really a connecting thread that runs through the letters. And, you know, I'll say one more thing about why I think that's important. A lot has been written, obviously, about you know, PTSD, and as, as an instructor, as a college teacher, I've had the chance to go to workshops and, and hear from veterans about what it's like to come back um, to campus. In fact, I participated in a training called the Military Ally Training at San Diego State University, where, um, you know, veterans want to inform educators about what it's like um, to go away and serve and then, and then come back. And so campuses, I believe, are doing a pretty good job of making veterans feel welcome or at home or or bringing them back into campus culture and life. You know, we we definitely try and do that. And yet I think there's often still a sense that veterans have of being isolated and, and the idea that maybe people don't really understand what they've, what they've been through. And when I read Dr. Post's work and when I read these newsletters, I'm convinced that, and again, I'm not sure, you know, how much Dr. Post intended that this would go down in the history books, but I think mm-hmm. it's remarkable that this newsletter really did a lot to mitigate or alleviate the sense of isolation that people feel when they're separated from their friends, from their family, when they go into combat. The newsletter really held this campus and this community together. And I, I think he und- that was his intention I think that's why he did this this work and why he was so determined to get a newsletter out regularly every single month. And, you know, students were moving all over the place. They were traveling all over the world, and they would often talk about how long it would take a newsletter to catch up with them. And it, and it did, and that's, I think, to the credit of the military um, and the Postal Service because they kept forwarding these newsletters. Mm-hmm. And, and Dr. Post would sometimes write to people, and he'd say, if you're getting your newsletter forwarded to you, write to me and let me know your new your new address. And that's where the typing classes really helped him because they were constantly typing up new mailing lists. And he really did his best to keep track of everybody. And a lot of the letters in the collection are students writing to say, I moved, I got promoted, here's my new address. Mothers would often, Dr. Post, here's my here's my son's new address. You know, make sure that he gets the newsletter. And families would sometimes say, You can send the newsletter to us and we'll forward it to them. But it was so important that they, that they get this newsletter. It really, and they called it their morale booster. They, they called it their number one morale builder and they looked forward to it. They talked about when they would get it. They literally would say, I had to stop the war so I could read my, read my newsletter. I stayed up half the night to read my newsletter. Mm -hmm. A nurse wrote and she said, you know, my patients are neglected because I got my newsletter. I had to read it. (laughs) Um, students talked about getting it. And it was better than a Christmas gift. Um, so, so you can really see through the letters how much they they relied on it. In fact, one one pilot, his name was Lionel Chase, and he he had a great sense of humor. There, there were several things that he was always looking for. One was Coca Cola. He always talked about how much he missed and, and was trying to get his hands on Coca-Cola. Uh-huh. Um, and then he also wrote about um, how much he looked forward to the newsletter. And he, he began one letter to Dr. Post. He, he moved around a lot, and he began one letter to Dr. Post by saying, SOS, SOS, where's my newsletter? <laughs> like, come on, you know, get it on the road. I need it. So, so that just gives you a, a sense of um, how much they looked forward to it and how much it, 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 it kept their spirits up. So with all these letters that you had to go through, how did you focus your uh, efforts for the book? You know, what, what theme or, you know, what did you look for? You know, initially I was just, I think, stunned by the emotion in the letters. It's really what captivated me first. 
Um, also, I, I was just always delighted that I was able to, this is sort of in my backyard, I live in San Diego, I was able to go into this reading room at the special collections, um, you know, room, the reading room at, in, in special collections at the SDSC library, and I was able to handle these original documents. You know, to me, that was just a phenomenal stroke of luck that I could do that. And my my thoughts initially, I was I was doing some graduate work. I just wanted to sort of, you know, write what I thought would be a literary thesis. But as I kept reading the letters, I realized that one, it was going to take me a lot longer than the duration of a, a graduate degree. So long after the, the the degree was over and done with, I, I kept reading the letters. It took me about two and a half years to read the full collection. Um, I was in there, you know, holidays and, and breaks and every chance I could get to read the letters. So so just the, the emotion, um, what it's like to sort of feel like you're touching history, um, to see Dr. Post's penciled notes. Um, I, I always say that, that touching a letter is a little bit like, like holding hands with the person just for a moment. <laughs> Yeah. You get to touch them and, and you hear their thoughts. So I was really just floored by the amount of emotion that came across. Also, these were really articulate young men and women, and, and that was just delightful to me. They they didn't have the sort of the shorthand that we use now, whether it's, you know, um, texting or emailing. They had to sit down and write longhand. Mm-hmm. And and they described vividly what they what they saw. And, and, and what they felt. And so the beauty of their words was was phenomenal to me. And then over time, I, I was obviously taking notes. Um, I was allowed to bring a computer into the reading room. And, and so I started to keep very careful notes. And I started to see over time um, the same letters by the same people, or, or different letters by the same people it's important to understand how the archive is arranged. So what the archivists have done is they've collected letters alphabetically by last name Mm -hmm. in each year. So you have 1942 A to Z, 1943 A to Z, etc. And so you might be reading in 1942 a letter by, I'll give you an example, a, a young man named Herman Adelson. And in 1942, he was just going into training. He was at training camp and he sends a letter and he's very proud, very proud to be in, in, in your training and in going into combat. And then he gets into paratrooper training. And so you might read later on in, in the next year that he's completed his paratrooper training. And I started to note the progress that different individuals were making during the war. And so I, I was able to sort of track their stories Mm -hmm. and that's when i realized that that there might be a book in this if i I could track enough individuals and enough stories um obviously you know this is a very american war story about world war ii so so they're in the pacific and then you start getting letters from north africa and italy and then they land in normandy you start getting stories from um Belgium and Germany, so you can really track the American progress through the war by by how these students are writing letters, and so and so as I was tracking, you know, the the, the location of the fighting and the stories of individuals, I started to see these connecting lines. And if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll read you um, just to give you a sense of the storytelling. One more. Um, um, so this is this is a letter from I mentioned Herman Adelson, and another thing that was delightful to me is that I got to the, know the students. They, they became very personal to me, mm-hmm. um, and and I got to know them by their nicknames. So they, so, so they signed their letters with with nicknames, and and Herman, who was very proud of being a paratrooper, called himself Little Geronimo. That was his that was his <laughs> nickname. Mm-hmm. And this is his, so this is from the beginning of 19, I believe, 1944. Um, and he's um, leaving New York. And he says, you've heard how tough the paratroops are, how rugged in physical endeavor. 
But what you don't know is how these same men felt as we boarded the ship and left the soil of USA. From the Staten Island ferry to the boat was something to witness. First, we joked and kidded as we passed familiar signs along the harbor like Maxwell House Coffee, Bethlehem Steel, Colgate Soap and Perfume, and then that thing that stopped the crowd, the Statue of Liberty. Tough guys had tears in their eyes. Many stood gazing open-mouthed. Many a heart was in one's mouth with a feeling of emptiness in one's pit of the stomach. The Statue of Liberty was beautiful, and as she disappeared, Long Island came into view, then Brooklyn, and what memories and laughs we all had. Then, as some giant hand pushing us way out, land seemed far off, New York skyline seemed to diminish. When that disappeared and possibilities of seeing land of U.S. was gone, we just leaned back and silence was a bliss as we all thought of what we left behind and what we are fighting for. Hmm. And I was, I was really amazed at the depth of emotion, not only in, in, in Herman Adelson's letters, but in, in so many other letters. And they really described their dedication and their determination. These young men and women really believed in what they were fighting for. They really understood at this, and he talks about, you know, this, the feeling in the pit of their stomach when they see the Statue of Liberty and the feeling in their heart. They knew they were fighting for what they believed were forces of good and forces of freedom and democracy. Right. That's what it, that's what it meant to them. And now I, I just want to share with you, you know, and this is the power of the newsletter, this came in a few months later. So this is a letter to Dr. Post a few months later. Dear Dr. Post, there was one little fellow we all knew, Herman Adelson, who was killed on D-Day. Hmm. And this fellow was my friend. I can remember lying on the grass discussing our ideals and hopes. And so I believe I can qualify to say to all our fellow staters that the price of this victory is written in memories of men like that. Not just flesh and blood, but the dreams and aspirations of men who will live forever in our memories. Yeah, that's, that's pretty powerful. That's, uh... The letters are full of these emotions and you know one of the one of the stories that I share in the book and and you know again these are these are stories that I had to sort of tease out over time as I was reading the collection um, a lot of these young men played sports um, and and their San, Di San Diego State um, in 1941, I believe it was, actually won uh, the National Basketball Championship. And and one of their star t uh, players, it was actually their star forward, a guy named Milton Phelps. His nickname was Milky. Everyone called him Milky Phelps. Mm -hmm. um, right after Pearl Harbor, a lot of these teammates enlisted so they, they, they went off to war and Milky was killed very early on he actually was uh, his he was in a, a training uh, crash he was a pilot and his plane went down in a training crash and so and so he lost his life and the campus was just devastated that this this star basketball champion who who'd taken their team through the national championship had suddenly been killed and they they talked and dr. post they talked about um, Later that year, during graduation, they, they held a moment of silence for him. They retired his jersey. They retired his number. By the time the war was over, three members of that team had lost their lives. So, so three members of that championship basketball team, a, a young man named Paul Fern was killed in the Pacific, and another um, uh, young man, Mason Harris, um, Mason actually survived the siege of Bastogne, 
he was trapped in that stone after the Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm. And he got a letter out to Dr. Post in which he described what it looked like when the C-47s came in and dropped supplies. And, and he said, those colored shoots as they floated down were beautiful. Words can't describe the feeling. He said, Doc, it's not possible to put on paper what one feels in those instances. And, and so he actually, he survived some of the worst of the fighting, went on to fight under General Patton in Germany and was killed in action. Yeah. And, and so it was devastating, you know, for me personally to, to hear Mason Harris survives this, this horrible siege. And then a few months later, oh, he was mm -hmm. under General Patton and, and, he, and, he, and he lost his life in Germany. Mm -hmm. but, but one of the family members who wrote to Dr. Post, they all, they all knew these guys. Um, she had lost her brother in, in the fighting. And again, Dr. Post wrote to her and said, can you confirm what happened? And she wrote to him and she said, yes. And you know, the obituaries would show up in the local paper. And, and she said, yes, my brother Joe was, was um, drowned. And then at the end of her letter, she wrote, I read in your newsletter that Milky Phelps and Paul Fern were also killed. And then she wrote to Dr. Post, my brother Joe is among friends. Hmm. It was comforting. In the midst of all this grief, it was comforting to this community to know yeah. that even in even in death, their loved ones were part of this greater community. They weren't they weren't alone. Right. Yeah. Um. So apart from the letters, um, did you what what other resources did you use for the the research and the writing? I had to do a lot of catching up because, as I said, I you know I didn't intend I didn't set out to write a history of of, of World War II, and so and you know the other thing I think that was tough is a lot of the history books really they give the scope of political decisions and military campaigns and and the numbers of, of you know people on both sides killed and wounded um and i i wanted to be able to put the letters in context but not bog them down in too much of that of that detail and you know another frustrating thing about about reading the letters at least for me is that at the time that people were writing they weren't writing little treatises on history. They were just writing what was happening to them in the moment. And so they might make scant reference to the political situation, but they weren't, they, they would assume that everyone else that they were writing to was up on current events. Mm -hmm. And so, and so I had to sometimes go back and say, okay, where were they and what was happening? And I had to try and sort of piece together the context that they assumed everyone who was reading their letter would already, would already know. And I ended up, I ended up using um, a couple of books that were sort of my, my go-to um, books. Anthony Beaver's mm -hmm. um, The Second World War, which is a very, very, very comprehensive history um, about World War II. And then for the specific um, theaters, um, The Pacific War, 1941 to 1945 by John Costello, very, very comprehensive um accounts of just the battles in the Pacific and, and their context and history. And then for North Africa and Italy, uh, Rick, Rick Atkinson's An Army at Dawn, mm -hmm. uh, 1942 to 1943, which really gave me um, some insight into, into the North African campaign. Mm -hmm. um, there were a, a number of, of students, pilots in particular, um, who were um, in North Africa and wrote Extensively, there was, there was one one young man, Bob Wade, who was in North Africa for about a year, and flew a number of campaigns. And so, and so, Rick Atkinson's book was really helpful um, in understanding um, that part of the war. You know, an, another thing that I that I did research on um, San Diego itself was very active. 
um, consolidated aircraft relocated here. So I read a lot of San Diego history um, mm-hmm. just to understand sort of the impact of the, um, the aircraft industry on our economy here. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was actually shortly before World War II, um, San Diego State put engineering on its curriculum right around the time that Consolidated built their aircraft plant here. So, so those two things seem to have gone hand in hand, you know, building, building aircraft and the engineering curriculum at San Diego State College. Um, the other thing that was fascinating to me about just San Diego history San Diego started as a teacher's college, and so it had a lot of women enrolled on campus, more so than I think the average college um, for its day. Mm -hmm. And women also left to go into service. They were part of every um, branch that would enlist them. So they were wax and they were waves with the Navy. Um, They were wasps, women Air Force service pilots. They They were nurses. They worked for the Red Cross. Um, and so I did um, a whole chapter, I think, in the book is devoted to women, but I had to do a lot of research um, to better understand the letters from the women. Hmm. And also, one of the things that really fascinated me is that San Diego was one of several campuses that had a civilian um, pilot training program beginning in, I think, 1938 or 1939, prior to World War II. Hmm. And again, you know, the Army Air Forces knew in the build-up to World War II that they were going to need trained pilots. Mm-hmm. And so what better way than to, than, than to start training college students? Mm-hmm. And so a lot of students from San Diego became pilots. And, and so sometimes the things that would guide my research were really the particulars of the letters and the particular experiences of students from, from this campus. In fact... San Diego State has a beautiful war memorial, and from the students that served in World War II, and there are there are lots of them listed on the memorial, I believe almost half of the names on the war memorial from World War II are of pilots. Mm-hmm. So San Diego trained a lot of pilots to go into World War II. So, um, were there any difficulties in getting the book published? Um, not really. I mean, I, obviously I had to edit it again and again, um, to bring it up to, to bring it up to snuff. Um, the Naval Institute Press, um, has been wonderful to work with. They, um, were interested in the manuscript right away. Mm-hmm. Um, I was able to get a little bit of financial backing to help with the publication. Um, but, but they took the net. I mean, they asked for um, um, some edits. I had to shorten it down. It was it was really long yeah. because, and that was really just my desire to cram every letter I could into the book. And so um, they worked with me, and I worked with their editors on on condensing it a little bit and 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 getting it into into I think better shape so that the storytelling um, comes to life a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Naval Institute Press was great. They were, they were interested in the manuscript. I think they saw the value in the letters from the, from the beginning. I'll I'll share with you one more piece of the research that was, that was kind of fun for me. Sure. Um, when I was working in the archives, um, and the archivists themselves were incredibly helpful because, you know, they, obviously I was in there every single week reading the letters, but when I needed to track down very specific pieces of information, they were helpful. Um, they understood the collection and, and were able to assist me. At one point, we had a very famous um, student writing letters. His name is Griff Williams, Griffith Williams, who was actually on the Doolittle Raid. Hmm. He was on, yeah, so Griff, um, I, as I said, we had a lot of pilots from San Diego. Griff Williams was the co-pilot on Plane 15 on the on the Doolittle Raid. Huh, okay. And he was able to write to Dr. Post after the raid was over when, again, you know, they had to wait until information could get into the news. Once it was published in the news, then Dr. Post could publish it. And after, after the Doolittle Raid, Griff came back to campus and he gave a talk on campus and Dr. Post published an excerpt from Griff's talk in the newsletter. And, and, and again, they considered this a morale, a morale builder. It was, it was sort of good for everyone to read these. You know, we had this victory and, and, and people were, were um, um, encouraged by that. But Griff went on to, he continued flying and he was eventually shot down um, 
in over Italy. And, in fact, Griff was the one who was initially thought to be killed in action. Mm. There's a newsletter where it has Griff's picture, and they thought he, he was listed as missing in action. And later they learned that he'd been taken prisoner. Well, you might remember when I was talking about the two brothers, Wally and Ernie. Mm -hmm. Ernie was shot down over the same territory. Both Griff and Ernie ended up in the same prisoner of war camp. They were both in Stalag Move 3, which was for, for pilots. Mm -hmm. And that, that um, prisoner of war camp is now within the boundaries of Poland. And at the time that I was doing my research, the, the museum archivists in that prisoner, the, the prisoner of war camp is now a museum, they were in contact with the San Diego archivists because they were trying to learn information about Griff for their own museum exhibit. And I happened to be in the archives one day, and I had just read a letter, and the letter said, thank goodness that Ernie and Griff are together, they'll be okay. And I thought, that, well, that's interesting that, that these two boys from San Diego State are, are together in this prisoner of war camp. And I thought, what a, what a, what a stroke of luck. Hmm. And, and so when the archivist at San Diego came, he, he showed me, he had just gotten a hold of the records from the POW camp that listed Griff Williams. And I said, find out, try and find out if there's anything on Ernie, because I know that they're in the same prisoner of war camp. I just read this letter. Well, 10 minutes later over the fax machine, Ernie's prisoner of war record came in. And I have a picture of this in the book. Ernie and Griff were cellmates. They were in the same cell. Huh. And so just through some stroke of fate, these two young men from San Diego ended up in the same in the same cell, in the same prisoner of war camp. Um, and, you know, one other thing about, about the, the POW camps that I'll say, Dr. Post kept a list of everybody that he knew of who'd been taken prisoner. And after the war ended, you know, and, and obviously it ended in Europe first, we were still fighting in Japan. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Post published after Victory in Europe Day, he published a column in the newsletter, and it was very somber, and he said, we can't celebrate yet, we still have our boys fighting in Japan. And he said, we're not going to celebrate yet. And then he kept a list, and he kept a tally, and every month as the newsletter was published, he would update it on who had been captured and who was being released. And it was like he had a checklist. And every month he was going down his checklist. He didn't stop until he knew that everyone who'd been taken prisoner was back home again. Yeah. Hmm. That's good. So where can people find uh, your work on on the web? So my website for No Forgotten Fronts is just the title of the book, www.noforgottenfronts.com, all one word. And you'll find links on that to some of my other writing. I mentioned my historical novel, The Chamber and the Cross. Mm -hmm. um, you can also find um, the book at the Naval Institute Press if you look at their spring catalog. Mm -hmm. No Forgotten Fronts will be out in April. And you can uh, learn a little bit about it. And I believe there's a little video that we made about the book. You can see um, samples of what some of the letters look like. So you can go to my website, No Forgotten Fronts. You can go to the Naval Institute website and look at their spring calendar. And you should be able to find um, pictures of what the letters look like and, and, a, and a little video that introduces the book and also some of the letters. Any final words? It's been a pleasure to talk to you. I'm always happy to um, talk about my work in the archives. And just by way of closing, I'll say that I'm grateful to and indebted to all of the students and veterans in my classrooms because it was really the inspiration that they gave me that led me to do this work. And they're never far from my thoughts. I'm always grateful to those who serve and to our veterans because they're the ones who gave me the inspiration to do this. And that's why we have these, these archives and that's why we do this work. Well, thank you for speaking with me. Thank you so very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you for listening. More information can be found at warscholar.org.